Welcome everybody to the Gray Swan Guild Day of the Swan Three. The id, the ego, the super ego, fire, air, and water. The power of three is important to all of us. And we're here today at the Day of the Swan to celebrate 24 hours of looking forward, looking backward, looking inside, looking outside together. Thank you, Eva, for commanding that fine performance. Denise, thank you for being here. Gary, Chuck, Augustine, Scott, Doyle, Jean Elvire. Jake, Steve, Steve, my friend Steve, good to see you here. Raphael, Soha, thank you for being with us at the Day of the Swan on our third session of the day, where we're joined by Thomas Euler from Lower Saxony, a friend of mine, a friend of the Guild. We're here today to talk about things future, things in the middle, things past. Thomas is a genius. I love his title on LinkedIn. It is founder, gardener of liquidity teams, a fundamental force of uh, nature in distributed systems, distributed currencies, distributed blockchain, and the basis of our new fan token in the Guild Swan Coin. So today we're going to spend some time talking about uh, some things of economy. I'm going to let Thomas introduces himself further, and I've got a few questions for him, but we've been uh, talking for a long time. Um, as I mentioned earlier in uh, the show, I uh, run an advisory, the Ironstone Advisory, and uh, some of my portfolio companies are building communities. So I've got a, an ArcGate company, it's called ArcGate VR, and it's a gallery of galleries on the metaverse. I've got another company that uh, I advise called Resuit which is a fashion company that is a platform uh, for fashion sharing. They need different economies, and Thomas's companies helps build them. Thomas, welcome. Hey, Rob, thanks for having me. Glad to, glad to be here in this uh, yeah, very cool event. I mean, I wasn't aware of it until like one week ago when we talked last time, but, uh, but really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I love the title, by the way. I'm a big, uh, I'm a big fan of Nassim Taleb, who made the the Black Swan concept famous. And uh, as you told me, uh, Taleb is even part of the origin story of the the name that you're using here. So yeah, cl glad to be here. Absolutely. Uh, when we called, when we were looking at the pandemic, and uh, we were looking at what was going on, some of us thought that this was an event. It's like a black swan. It must be a black swan, this thing. And then as I was on this thing called Twitter, the Muskian universe now, uh, I reached out because I was watching Nicholas Taleb say vociferously, this is not a black swan. I'm like, wait, what? And I'm like chatting with him. Wait, what? It, it is a black swan. It's big. It's awful. No one expected it. And then he schooled everyone because exactly, Killian, completely predicted and there's... The nature of a black swan, it's unknowable. We'll know a black swan the next one because if Nicholas is alive, he will class it as a black swan. He's the only one. So Grace Swan is something that is terrible, awful, impacts the world, but entirely predictable. And that's why we talked earlier about the next pandemic. Now, how do we bridge this, Thomas? Is is well, I, cryptocurrency I, I have a second one. No, but I have, a, I, I have a good segue for you because I can, I can tell you that I think Taleb was one of the maybe two or three very important um, factors and, and people who I enjoyed reading and his concepts about, about like, he thought, if you're not familiar with Taleb, he talks about randomness, he then termed this coin anti-fragility, essentially, how, how can we build things that become better from from shocks from these black swan events so he's really even though he wouldn't describe himself like this he's like a systems thinker and and i was really following his work and i also back in my old days i worked in consulting nowadays you would probably describe it as digital transformation consulting and so i worked a lot with organizations and and what i what of course and first i started more on the technology side but i quickly learned well it, it mostly it's organizational structures that are the problem when it comes to the inability to be 
innovative, to adapt your business, to change. And so I created at some point, like, like a draft, a big uh, uh, Microsoft, I think it's called OneNote, their, their Evernote competitor product, a big file about the book that I called Decentralized, how we are going to build the world of the future. That was before I did go deep into, into the whole blockchain world. But decentralization def definitely has been like a meta topic that I've been very interested in for, for a long time. And at the time I knew about Bitcoin must have been like 2013 probably. And, and Bitcoin and this whole world was somewhat interesting to me, but it was mostly something people played around with back then. But more and more people then around 2015 started to mention concepts like smart contracts, decentralized aut autonomous organizations. And that was the time when I started to go really, really deep in this new space because it related to so many topics that I, that I already already dabbled with. Now, our, our product and what we do today, and we maybe touch upon later, is, is only like, like you need to look really behind the curtain to see how that is influencing what we are doing there. But I tried this as a little, a little segue while also letting you know a bit more. Thomas, I know that, I know that uh, you are an economist uh, and, I, and you're like, uh, like me, you're a digital consultant and transformation specialist. specialist. I want to take you back, though, take you back in the past where the point at which you didn't know about blockchain, right there in the middle where all of a sudden you knew about it. Tell me what was the story of when you saw it first and you realized, hey, whoa, whoa, wait a second, this is important. Was there a flash? Was it a moment? Go back there. Think back where the first time you heard about it and you're like, wait, what? And was it a flash or did it, was it a slow roll change? I think there have been several moments, like probably two or three, but, but I think I really heard about Bitcoin. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, a few times in the very, very early days. Sadly, I didn't set up a miner or anything back back then because it was just like this yeah currency and because i was already so interested in decentralization and and like decentralizing the financial system was something that uh, that was a bit in my wheelhouse so yeah i was i heard about it but i didn't look at it then i remember there was a big media story when somebody bought the pizza for ten thousand bitcoin um, and that was that was a meme story but still not enough to get me to get me deeper into it and like i like i said before there was then really this point where, where these at i think it was at one specific conference in dublin and at this conference it was a general tech conference but people talked about smart contracts and decentralized autonomous organizations so to explain the idea a bit so there is not a clear-cut definition back then it was about mostly automated uh, uh, org organizations essentially mm. But but the people I was talking to then really had the vision that value creation, how we in our world create value, was already significantly changing. And, and I'm not talking the, the blockchain world or Web3 space here. I'm talking about just you as well consult organizations you probably see if you are in a team working on a project it's usually not like one person from one organization in in a meeting room working on something but it's many people from from different organizations and then on the web of course we since a long time we already see people come together not uh, physically but ex essentially what you're doing here right the people they have a shared interest they come together they start something they they build ventures maybe it's not even companies, but it's just an open source project that they put somewhere on, on GitHub and people just start to contribute. And that is a new way how value is created in the world. And now suddenly there was this layer that was somewhat technological, a bit financial, but also people, people with different backgrounds were super active at this time in the blockchain space. So, so one very interesting thing is what is called mechanism design. Mechanism design is essentially like 
applied game theory and and people there did not only uh, only think about code and how to build systems but also like about new ways of governing these network organizations that are not traditional entities not in a legal sense but also not in an organizational sense and and one of the key challenges that i think prevails to this day is we see the the internet brought upon us like this winner takes all type of environment where you have a few big platforms who aggregate giant markets onto onto their platform like say an uber when it comes to mobility we have an amazon for commerce we have youtube for for attention and so so suddenly we were in this world and and the web3 movement at this time so there were the financial people the traders the, the let's make a quick profit but there were these people who really thought and to this day think about how can we reshape the digital economy in a better way how can we have like these these services that are so clearly useful but by the fact that they are like privately owned for profit institutions where users create a lot of the value but but they get i mean they get some sort of value out of it but certainly no no financial maybe you could argue that probably mobility much cheaper because the VCs that invest in Uber subsidize so much, but that is a long trail. So essentially we make these platforms big, we give them our attention, we sometimes give them our money, but but we don't get anything out of it. And we certainly don't govern these. And I mean, you mentioned Twitter before, uh, uh, of course, Twitter now being a case in point, but maybe it's some sort of co community governance structure for this would be more interesting. And that is one, like, like if you take the field of blockchain that is like one niche within within that bubble and that was that that were the themes and the storylines that really caught my attention and that drove me to get deeper deeper into that space and then not unlike you the, the one first step was to found a network organization untitled inc that did really um that did really try to assemble people who were interested in the space for the right reasons so not getting rich quick even though if that happens not too bad but you know what i mean right if that's the mm -hmm. primary motivation maybe and that's you have great. many of these guys so you know when uh, i've been uh, when i find a technology and that's one of my my specialties is that i'm, I'm supposed to find technologies that will work in the area of the economy that I have lived in, which is in banking, insurance, large government, and military. And uh, over my career, I keep finding these technologies. So I have uh, uh, this cycle that I go through. And I'm always watching something new. I engage with new people and new organizations, and I watch trends. But it, for me, in the cycle, I'll go through this kind of spiral where I'll see something and it'll cause a signal. And, uh, I'll say to myself, that, that's interesting. Client server, wow, interesting. Uh, Object-oriented computing, small talk, interesting. And it'll, it'll cycle. And then if there's an increase in signal, I start getting more and more interested. So I know exactly when I heard about blockchain for the first time. I was at a presentation at an unconference in Toronto called PodCamp. Uh, which is a really great conference, uh, try and go every year. But I was sitting there and uh, the presenter, who I didn't know at the time, but is a friend of mine now, was all excited about this thing called the blockchain. And the signal that it mapped in my brain, when I, the way he was talking about it, about how it would change the world and how it was really everywhere and how it was this thing. And it was like, this is a long time ago. So Bitcoin, less than $100. Um, I got the thing, it's, it's, this guy's talking about this thing. He's talking it like, a, like it's a browser on the internet and it's going to change things. Then I dialed in, but I didn't do anything. The next thing that was a big signal was uh, was Ethereum. When Ethereum hit and smart contracts were, were defined, I saw a big uh, overlap in what I do in insurance. I define, you know, if you're using a, uh, a mechanism like a blockchain, if you have a smart contract, an insurance policy, it's a contract, you could implement insurance on blockchain. And that's been cycling through and that's big. I don't think blockchain is ever going away now. I think it's just part of what we talk about a way of doing technology. Uh, that's what happened to me. Uh, and I've never bought a slice of Bitcoin. 
And uh, before before it was because it was illegal. I'm involved in I'm in very very critical formal things, and there are things I I can't do that are illegal. That that's just my practice. I'm an ethical business person. Uh, but I do remember in Toronto thinking, okay, now I'm going to do this. This is years later. It's uh, maybe thousand dollar price for Bitcoin, and uh, it was the first time I walked into an organization. And I saw them on uh, online first, but I was on Spadina Avenue, Chinatown in Toronto, and there was a store, and they had an ATM machine. And you could set up a wallet and buy Bitcoin there. And I stood in front of it and I had a $50 bill in my hand. And Thomas, I couldn't do it. Even though there was an ATM machine, I couldn't put $50 in. And when I read the instruction, I had to give my identification and they took a scan of my passport or my driver's license. So identity, 50 bucks. And I didn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I don't perceive myself as a conservative person, but I thought it was like, you know what? I just don't know where this is going. So I didn't do it. What, mm -hmm. On your respect, you looked at it and then you started liquidity games with your partners. Why did you do that? When a guy like me who knew he was on trend couldn't do it. So, I mean, like most startups, you you start with like some kind of hypothesis and then you you go go on and you find out what you need to be doing versus what you thought that you ought to be doing and like the the initial hypothesis that we had when we started liquidity was actually much more in the financial realm than where we are now because we thought that for sports the sports market specifically so we set out because one of my co-founders had a long track record and a great network in the sports industry that this could be a very interesting market for a new kind of crowd financing way for sports organizations where fans would co-invest into into their favorite club their favorite team a bit like i mean over here in europe that is maybe a bit more common because there are different organizational models than than in us sports where everything is like completely privately owned and it's clearly for 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 business and we saw an old school thing that some clubs had done which was they call it in german fan anleihe so it's a fan bond so it's just a bond issued by a football club to finance itself and fans buy it and it would have usually when clubs did it that you did get this certificate which was nice looking and then you, you know really paper bonds they have these interest slips so you had to buy it from your bank and then give back these slips to your to your bank and back at this time a lot of actors were just working on what is called security token so properly regulated financial instruments and we had just seen BaFin so our SEC equivalent over here in Germany um, let the first few STOs go ahead so and at this point we thought cool let's build this as a product then we started talking to different clubs using Hendrix network and they so, so our vision was to combine this financing tool with what in sports they call fan engagement. So many ways for people who own one of these tokens, security tokens to, for instance, get access to players and ask them questions or get, get some kind of exclusive content and, and all these things. So what then the clubs we talked to told us was mm, finance, financial products and so on, not really that interesting but we would be really, really interesting in the fan engagement part of it. And, and that was really when we started to say, okay, let's build a software solution that is a toolkit for sports organizations or for everybody who has like an established audience or fan base for that matter to create a community where you can have more ways than on like, a, a typical website or, or whatnot to interact with them to create exclusive things but only people who back then we started with a mechanism of tokens so bitcoin is one type of crypto token there are many other cryptocurrencies but but we just kept it more as a as a gamified element within the unify 
platform solution. So Unify is what we call our core product nowadays. And, and then we created a lot of these mechanisms and the platform grew over time. And today it's really like a web platform builder. It's a bit like you probably know Squarespace as a website builder, but it's for an interactive platform that is owned by you. We have besides sports, several content creators, YouTubers, who are using it. And going back to decentralization here, I think it's really, really important for everybody who has an audience to not be completely reliant on one big platform, but to have your own, to have your get, to get your data yourself, have independent business models that you can that you can create and to make this super easy and to foster a strong sense of community. Because even media companies nowadays really see that that just publishing alone isn't enough anymore. Like audiences today, they want to interact, they want to, to co-create with, uh, uh, with their favorite creators. And, and in that sense, media organization is a creator and even a sports club, right? They create an entertainment product and we, we have developed this toolkit. And, and besides tokens, we also introduced one because it was a big hype topic, but also because it's a neat tool to do things. Uh, NFTs as one module, but then we have a lot of like web 2.0 functionality as well from user generated content and, and votings. These are based on the blockchain, but they wouldn't necessarily have to be on the blockchain as well. So, so that's a long winded way of, of saying we, we, we thought early on that there is value in this technology for communities around sports rights holders. And then we figured out in which way fans find it valuable, but also, but also the people who have the fans find it valuable. And we took this as, as a starting point to build a product, but not a theoretical product. Like what is really cool, like you told me about like the early days and in the early days the user experience of everything blockchain was really shitty it was like hard you had to install dedicated software you you had to manage your private keys something that is i mean even passwords that's tough for many people or you have like these 12 word recovery mnemonic phrases and so on and, and we knew from early on it needs to be it needs to work for your everyday sports fan. And, and most of them don't want to know, don't have to know, are not interested in anything, blockchain, crypto, and whatnot. And so we built this. And nowadays, one of our, oh, I guess, the most notable client we have is Borussia Dortmund, probably by, by this weekend, the uh, next German champion. And they they their fans they don't ask how it works they just use it and i think this in itself is quite an achievement and an important one because if you want to be critical about the space as a whole i guess it's it's a technology is certainly here to stay but also one that struggled to found a market unlike ai right ai is currently having its product moment where where many tools actually get traction mass traction among users they have business models that are at least somewhat working, maybe compute is still too expensive or becoming more expensive, but that is working. And in the Web3 blockchain space, we there, there's less of it, sadly. So I've got, I, let's see, I see your hand up there, Pleasure. <laughs> off. Uh, and uh, please ask uh, the question. Denise, a uh, good comment there. There's a lot of negative things around uh, about the, uh, Blockcoin, Bitcoin, the ICO disaster that happened. We'll cover that too, Denise. And uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some origins and a little bit about basketball. But Basir, over to you. Comments, questions? Thank you, Thank you sir. Two quick questions. First one is uh, smart contracts. Uh, can you explain it a bit further? Is it a far better option, number one? And I guess uh, given the insurance companies underwriting it is a uh, blessing because at least they'll be able to save their principal even if things uh, go belly up, but are they also able to keep <laughs> the earnings? Uh, that's my uh, first question. And the second question is, there's a whole lot of uh, disinformation, manipulation, and uh, you know, colossal amount of propaganda that basically prevents people from making good sound judgments. So let's say if you were to ask, uh, advi give advice to your friend who has a small uh, nest, uh, 
gold uh, nest egg, you know, what should they look for psychologically speaking? How should they think about it? Thank you. Okay, so let's start with the, the first one, Thomas. I don't know anybody on the planet who I wouldn't ask first, other than you. Like, what's a smart contract? And explain it to my mom, who's eighty. I mean, the first thing that you need to know about smart contracts, it's neither is it smart nor is it a contract. It's just a bit of code, and and that bit of code is deployed on a blockchain or a a public network and that has certain properties so once it is deployed it is it cannot be changed or tinkered with at least on most blockchains nowadays we have so many different architectures for blockchains but the basic idea is you you put this piece of code out there everybody can see what it does and everybody can verify that it works as intended and it will if, if for instance like, like rob said if a certain condition is met it will execute as programmed be, beforehand so it has some similarity in the logic to to a contract but it's very often not legally binding because it was not created by lawyers even though that is also happening by now but and and there are it's also not completely trustless even though people in the blockchain world will sometimes claim this that it's completely trustless but for instance if you want to verify that a fact has happened you still need the data source that is what is called the oracle problem so there are people working on this as well and sometimes it's maybe even another real world concern let's say in the sports world there is an outcome of a game and if that is the outcome of the game, even if like one company like, like Opta, big data provider in sports provides the result, that is the case. And then it's more theoretical, like how to decentralize this and so on and so forth. Um, but, but yeah, that is essentially what a smart contract is, a little piece of code. Yeah, I, when I saw and, it, and the, since I know about what today's insurance contracts are, policies, if you get that thick piece, the thick envelope from your uh, insurance company, that's the real policy. Uh, one of the greatest expenses in an insurance company is recording those policies because that policy is a promise. Your promise, part of the contract is you pay premiums. Their promise is like if something bad happens, they pay out the policy. So it, you're, it's one of the highest regulated industries in the world, stable uh, insurance is, because if there is a bond of trust there, you, there is a uh, expectation to pay out. And then anything, as I see it, uh, that can reduce the cost of doing that for the consumer or the insurance company is a good thing. Anything that's self-organizing is a good thing. Anything that you can find and share when you need it and you can uh, share it amongst people is a good thing. Go ahead, Thomas. No, sorry, oh, I just had to oh, that was a, that was a really myself. Okay, I thought it was like, yeah. so I was like, well, I, I thought, so uh, over the other side of the question, uh, if we've uh, talked about smart contracts, um, how do we, if I'm gonna frame this this year, how do we make this easier for people? I think that part of what you've done in your inspection of going from looking at securities in Germany and jumping into that world and then moving to the sports world and then really in a real Steve Jobs, Tim Cook frame, make it simple and remove the technology from people. Um, and how do you, how are you seeing the adoption? Like you chose to go in the sporting uh, market. Uh, you found your first lead customer in uh, the Raptors of Germany, I call them, because I'm just a Raptors fan. You yeah. know that we have that debate, which is a better basketball club. Um, so uh, was that part of the adjustment to, uh, to choose a market where you really focused on people's behaviors and you serve them in a new way? to make it easier for people to do something that wasn't about money, it wasn't about Ponzi scams, it was about just engaging. Is that a way of making and moving the fear from some of these things or tech? Perfect? Yeah, and, and just make it useful. And so, so you mentioned the Raptors, I'm a big NBA fan. Before founding Liquidity, I never worked in the sports industry actually, but uh, I was following it. And as a fan myself, I also think I had an understanding of how, how I followed sports versus how probably a generation ago people followed sports. And, and something that I clearly saw, leaving all the blockchain stuff aside, is 
a few very important trend lines. One, people were increasingly following players rather than clubs. They became fan of players. And that, that I mean, the, the, in the history of the internet since Web 2.0, we see that people just like people better than brands. And, and now social media gave us this toolkit to scale human individuals to levels that we never had before. So, so I, I would even say that is why brand as a concept came into place because organizations became so large. And, and now this happened in sports. People followed the players and people had new expectations when it comes to stuff they are a fan of, right? Many kids, so sports is in competition with stuff like Twitch streamers and gamers. It's in competition with all the quote unquote creator economy and so on. And we also saw that if you bring a new product to market, you need like a first market and a segment where you can provide a lot of value, but also competition is not steep and there are not so many established players. And when it comes to like building your own and owned community, then sports is definitely under catered. So if you want to build a product, you need to somehow create network effects and so on. And we thought instead of doing it from the ground up, let's leverage existing networks and communities, but, but in a place where that is not yet digitized in the way that it should be. Now, it turns out like so often, I mean, it's, it's simpler said than done. And, and there are certainly like like our our own struggles that we have when it comes to to getting these organizations to buy in and understand it but i think we are we are now definitely at a point where the the market itself starts to talk about communities so so good for us but but i i think i lost a bit the track of what your what your question was on the it's uh, reducing fear right so i know that yeah. one of the things mentioned earlier was uh, just like get rid of the tech side of it, make sure that that it's really just about the team and the fan. And then yeah. remove what I see and why we're going to adopt Unify as our uh, fan token, and we're going to call it Swan Coin, is because I understand our audience and I, I want to reduce the effect of technology. I don't want people to be mad at them. You know, so I want them to be in the guild. I want them to uh, to volunteer for things because we're paying them swan coin. I want them to uh, to buy our people's time or give an incentive to people to come work with them by paying them in swan coin. I want to create behaviors, but I don't want to go <laughs> to a science class or tech class. I don't want anyone programming this stuff. I just want them to yeah. engage an event like this. And then uh, at the end of the event, uh, given incentives and disincentives, pass swan coin among them and see what evolves. And I'm and th this experiment, and we run a lot of experiments. Um, I know in discussing with you that I know my theory is correct. I know that, uh, that I've gone through the setup of Unify, the beginning parts, and we're going to roll this out. So that's I think parts of the fear re reducing down. And then I know that I've boxed this experiment in a very tiny way. Like this is a, a, a place where we trust each other. This is a place where it's built for experiments. And then uh, we're designed, uh, we're designed much like you are, um, to keep things very simple. And I think that's the what we're doing on our side. But uh, let's talk about uh, about uh, the guild and your impressions. Like your your team is built Unify. It's for an organiz uh, organization like ours. We've got different levels of engagement. Uh, we've got people that want to do things together and they want to explore things. And um, what do you think our experience is going to be like? implementing swan coin on unify i hope a very good one and i hope one that drives engagement between between all the people in the community and and creates um more incentive more fun in actively participating so so one thing for for instance that is ingrained into into unify we have a mechanism that we call boost so that is how one of the ways ah there is a screen share ah okay i see what you're doing so we have one mechanism that we call boost and that is essentially the tokenized equivalent of a like button it's also sometimes used for upvoting things and now the neat thing is 
like all the users can collect tokens or in your case, Swan coins. And there are different ways of how you can distribute them. Of course you could sell them. I assume you will not sell them, no. um, but you can give them out as a reward for all types of actions users do in your community. For this, we have a thing, we call it giveaways. Crypto people would call it airdrops, but we keep it simple and understandable also on the language level. So, so the giveaway could be somebody opens your, your Swan Guild app or platform or whatever you want to call it. And then for this, they get a few tokens. If they create a content, they can get a few tokens. If they create a content that is valuable to others, they get a few tokens. And so you get this circulation within platform users where just by contributing to the community, you will accumulate more tokens, which then in turn you can use in different ways. So you cannot, for, for now, for regulatory constraints, you cannot just cash them out or sell them to others, but that's not even necessary to have a good user experience. Because what you can do, for instance, you can have premium content that is then, for, that is then unlockable with these tokens. And of course, internally, you could even have a system like similar to what Spotify does with the listens, where in, of course, like there is an algorithm that tracks which songs get listened to, there is a pool of money coming in and then it's distributed. So you could even go as far as say, hey, people create good content, create insightful articles or, or podcasts or video sessions that make us all smarter. But, but depending on how many token get used as a boost mechanism, you will get a monetary payout or another opportunity in, in the guild. I don't know all the details of how you operate internally, but you could do this and just have this little tool that makes people want to contribute that, that gives you a, a reward for doing so. And if you want to drive this, that people, that people interact and share more, I think that in itself can be a neat little mechanism. Yeah, that's a, it's a long hour thinking. Uh, when uh, we started designing it and our tech community within the guild, the tech SCAC group, when we talked about coins and distributed uh, administration, the ideation turned into like, oh, well, let's, we can try and do this because we're all volunteers. Uh, and the initiation of the guild, we never charged fees to be involved. Everything is free that we do. But we had a goal out of the first <laughs> to become sustainable, and that means money, but we're talking about different ways of running money. And so this idea came up that we should be able to do something with coins, whether it's jump in and just buy a Bitcoin. I, I, we had that offer that we should just raise some money, buy a Bitcoin together, and then surf the value of that and grow it up. That was one idea. The other idea is more akin to what you're talking about of like, okay, let's just create an internal economy where we're trading amongst each other. We already trade. We already help each other and uh, we're forming subgroups and new adventures are, are forming from this. So when I think of this idea- I mean, you could also do, so, guild... sorry, Rob. Oh, well, please, for, go ahead. For, for interrupting. I, I mean, so there there is another feature that we have. It's what is called an ideation mission. So back in the days, people used to talk about crowdsourcing. So what it allows you is to post a challenge a, a problem to your audience and they can come up with their ideas how to tackle this now as a as a guild as a think tank you bring together different people with different interesting perspectives now you can do this internally but that is also a way how how you could start to earn money by opening this up to third external parties who want to use the wisdom of your crowd of your guild and and say okay you can you can now on our platform have the swan guild grace swan guild that is uh, solve problems answer questions and in there we then again use the the token mechanism for upvoting so you know what are like the com com the favorite solutions of the community and so on but yeah that could be a nice little experiment yeah, I, you could set up yeah. if that works if there is a market for this. So I'm hoping I can do this, but we're, we're probably going to issue 10 million Swan coin. And then uh, we'll, uh, when you join as a member, we're going to issue a thousand Swan coin per member so that they have an account, a wallet with something in it. And then the basic thing along, because we do events, we're going to model, we do this digital thing that's called events. So we know that's already got a 
nascent economy to it. So the idea is on events that anyone who produces an event, any of the speakers, instead of being paid in money, we'll pay them in swan coin. So we'll, we'll, we'll give that incentive, like you can earn swan coin. And then the producers and associate producers, content providers, they'll also earn not as much as the key talent, but they'll earn 100 swan coin or 10 swan coin for certain behaviors. Now, the earning or the earning side, I've kind of got that in my head because of the framework of something simple like an event, something simple like selling, you know, paying people to produce things. I get that. Now, the flip side of it, like now that I've got, now Denise has earned because she's a content provider, she's an organizer. When you're in an event like this, we should give you 5,000 swan coin. Now, what can we give on this side of like, what's on the other side of having a harder time with, what are the things that people would want to be paid for? What, what will they use their swan coin for? Now you have a thousand, like, what do you do the other side of the balance sheet? What are some of the ideas that you've seen in, in some of your customers and uses of fan token for the other side? So I've earned 5,000 swan coin. What do I do with it? Sure. So we don't yet have like a customer who is this is in this setup like like a guild but i think there are there are a few things that come to mind so the first one is actually what i said before with spotify so you could use this as a way to let let's say at some point your events may make a profit then you could say okay the profit is distributed amongst contributors according to to how many tokens they have or give back then, of course, you can say, okay, in this community, we create like content, but it needs to be unlocked with tokens by people because it is really valuable. So they can could spend it on this. And the same works also for all types of community interactions. And here, I think there could be really a market because I assume while all of your members are really interested and willing to learn and willing to share, they also have only 24 hours per day. So their time is by definition valuable. And now people could start offering their services um, in exchange for, for SwanCoin, or you act as an intermediary in, in between there, but really say, okay, we have like a favor economy, but it's not really only a favor. It's also like you only unlock favors uh, if, you, if you collect a certain amount of community credit. So that's not necessarily what, what you have to like just from a mindset perspective, because it turns the, the idea of sharing into something that is more quantified, almost almost monetized, but it's yeah. something that you that you could do. And g given the time constraints that that all of us have in our daily lives, it would it would be like, hey, I know I can only allocate, I don't know, five hours per week to this one guild. And these five hours one of which I will use to, to, I don't know, share an insight, but four of which I will help another member, but which member that is, is decided by who wants to, wants to use their community currency. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's uh, those are great. Those are inspiring. Um, that idea of time, I know that that is the most valuable thing to me on earth is time. And uh, I can see that uh, if we had, I know, I know we have different skill sets in the guild and we can offer a market of like, okay, I will give you an hour of my time and it's X one coin for that. And if, well, my time you get it, that's my commitment. And then it's a contract. If I deliver, you paid and that's an open market and that could evolve. I can see the different people would have different skills. Uh, one of the things I was also kicking around in my head is just to uh, model the value with connecting swan coin to real world is just set a baseline that the value of a swan coin every day is the minimum wage in the country you're in. And how to just sort of attach a value to it, to have a floating idea of what that's worth. <laughs> so that if you want someone's time in Canada and the, the most expensive province to live in, in the world, it's about $20 an hour. We could just set that, that's the baseline. So think of it, if you want an hour of time, at least pay me one swan coin, which is really kind of $20 an hour. So I can sort of frame the economy. I mean, and, well, I do that. There's some work that I do for the guild that's worth less than $20 an hour. Rob, <laughs> make a, you know, Canva promotion item that promotes something. Okay, well, that takes me about seven seconds and I'll take a swan coin for that. So maybe a market could emerge. We've got to, to, uh, that, Denise, to your point, bartering, maybe we can get that market. And then Denise, your idea, like I've wanted to do a prediction 
betting board. So the idea there, Denise, if I'll, I'll see if I can do this. Um, the idea there was like you earn Swan Coin by doing like scut work for the guild, like cut and paste shit, that kind of stuff. You earn a thousand Swan Coin, but you take that Swan Coin and you can bet on a prediction market, and then we run it like a 50-50, right? So, but you're only winning the Swan Coin. So we in Treasury get half, so we get recover, and you get Swan Coin if you win. So that way you can work, earn Swan Coin, bet, earn more Swan Coin. And then if we can attach it to other values, and this is where it gets tricky with the law. As soon as I, I start saying like, oh yeah, a Swan Coin is like $100, or is a hundred dollars, or is an ounce of gold? Then it's a security, isn't it, Thomas? I mean, not a security lawyer in Canada myself. So, but it very likely, very likely, you are getting into a territory <coughs> where it's at least dicey. <coughs> oh, apologies. So, when you create these shadow economies, uh, I know that there will be a Swan store. I know we will sell T-shirts. And the swan, if we can raise some funds on events like this, if you put some money in our tip jar, I'm going to post the link at the end of this one. Uh, we'll put that money into a store and we'll achieve some value and be all, allow people to earn money to buy things in the store, which actually we buy with real money, but you'll be able to buy them there, whether it's the uh, special signed edition by the, uh, the uncertainty book or specialized things that we create as creators. And we just rotate this economy. So just like a government can quote unquote, print money, we can actually do this idea. And that's what we're ideating around. Thanks, Denise, for the idea that, that I'm going to put, it'll be the Denise Tsang prediction board betting house, and you're the editor-in-chief bookie. What do you think? <laughs> I just wanted to be the, the winner, but yeah, I'd love that. You want to be the love winner. Betting. I love it. <laughs> Uh, gambling is a uh, gambling is human nature. I think that's part of why we have economies and people have figured out it's edge economies. How do you, Thomas, in uh, in your sporting uh, team, uh, is anyone using Fancoin as proxy betting? Sorry, no problem. I had a bad... <laughs> mm, no, because that is also very dicey, and uh, our clubs would shy away from this. Yeah. Right. I got you. So uh, interesting. And this is all experimental. So we're coming towards the end of the time. If there are any questions you have about, about tokens, fan tokens, ideation around these things, we do want to interest this and in, introduce this into the guild that's happening. We've got the initial setup. And then uh, we'll run uh, some tests on the way into Thousand Day Radar that uh, we're going to issue coin to people involved in that radar and build a fan economy around events, creative items, and see if we can do the same type of thing that happens in, I'll tell you, every modern platform video game has an in-game um, economy. And uh, in 12 months, I predict that we'll have a chief economist of the guild who will advise us on how to make this thing work. And I think it'll work. Sounds good. Just one thought that I had on on the entire prediction market thing. I mean, there there are various like blockchain projects, companies that that are in this space, and even long before this, like prediction markets. If you bring the right type of people together to to participate in predictions, have proven to be much much better at predicting outcomes than if there is nothing at stake. So. This could almost also be a ser service that you could offer to companies, organizations to to help them for look into look into the future. By once it has like an internal value in your community, it also like we have a simple feature: voting, and we have different modes. So it can be just one vote per user. It can be a vote to vote. You need to put up a certain amount of tokens. Or uh, uh, you need to you you can choose with how many token you want to vote. So expressing the strength of your belief in a in a given outcome, and then you could have ways where like the winning the the voters who who voted on the right outcome they 
get something from what the company pays you or so. So yeah, I think there are neat ways and having this chief economist, definitely, definitely not the worst idea. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I, I know it's complicated as I'm drawing out the system, um, but it, we have very, very intelligent people, very, very forward thinking people in the guild. And I know that just in doing things informally, some of how we created the, in Cygnus Ventures, created the uncertainty book was gathering that collective intelligence, mapping it into a book with uh, no incentives uh, for people that's just uh, right now it's by fame, uh, I guess, and, and, and a desire to, to communicate. But in this case, um, this is the head breaking part. If we can set up a prediction market using tapping into the intellect of the guild, it creates a, so the intensives are coins, you bet with coins, you make more, so you do create those predictions, but the predictions themselves, the outcomes are suddenly valuable. And suddenly someone maybe want to subscribe to those but they would subscribe with money. And the money would go back into the community. And then based on your coin shares, you would get yeah. the share of the subscription. So you've got this dual economy going on, swan coin to create the predictions, audience who wants to buy that subscription because it's valuable. That's an interesting mechanism and a different kind of economy. Normally you just use money, right? You would say, okay, we're going to hire the guild. We're going to get the 10 top, or the 50 top analysts of the guild, we'll pay them $10,000 each to predict. And then we'll assemble that and have 1 million people subscribe to that. And then the operation would take the profit from that. I don't wanna work that way anymore. So that's the idea. Good one, Denise, you are the chief economist <laughs> pending. <laughs> Monsieur, yeah. comment. Yeah. Uh, officially, uh... The electronic uh, uh, trading markets was developed by DARPA, Defense Advanced Research uh, Projects uh, Office or Administration, that's doing work for the uh, DOD. I mean, officially it's uh, 20 years ago, but probably it may go a little <laughs> further back and it has uh, yielded great results and the goodjudgment.com is a result, uh, is also an outcome of that uh, product used by a broader uh, community so we could basically uh, ask for their uh, support and their ideas as to, you know, they would also love to probably, I hope, share their information with us or just uh, mentor us. That's great. Thanks very much. Okay, so Thomas, last big question, and then we're gonna go into the rapid five. So the last big question, big question is three years from now, it's 2026, it's a thousand days away. What do we see? What's important? What are we doing? Where's the future? That's a big one indeed. I mm. warned you. I warned you. The future always comes no matter what we do, because time is immutable. It always comes. So I'm giving you time to think about the future now until you give <laughs> me the cough two more times. And then you're going to say, Rob, in 2026, we're sitting in Frankfurt. We're smoking a cigarette because, you know, that's what you do in Frankfurt. My, my cup is what over in three years. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the, so I would keep it on like the, the tech Aiken area of the future because it's where I'm most at home. And I think we are going to see that what is currently emerging and as the creator economy will combining a few trends together like the the big topics of the last few years there's been like web3 there's certainly been the metaverse we currently have ai so let, let's see which role ai is going to play there but i think we will we will see a lot more fully digital economies that form around digital digital goods that for the first time are really ownable but also limited so that was one of the big innovations that that blockchain brought right it introduced scarcity to the digital realm by by having digital objects that can not be copied but only transferred so so and that is if you think about 
metaverses where people already you see stuff like buy a bit of country in a metaverse i mean that's uh, an old way in the sense that we, we already saw people doing this in like second life back in the days but but nowadays at least you have also ownership because you can own these goods they they, they will also be more interoperable and and whether it's used in gaming environments or non-gaming environments this will mean that you can create digital things that are scarce that can have value and utility in certain environments and this will spark economies because in the in the good old physical economies you we always saw that at the point in time when you had strong protection of ownership so there was no king who could just take your land or whatever and nobody cared but we really started protecting ownership that also meant flourishing economies because people started to take more risk to to build new things to to invest and I think that is going to happen in the digital economy along those trend lines. And in three years, we will see at least the third, first outlines of these truly digital economies. So Thomas, uh, I'm going to hold you this. This is recorded, right? So three years from now on Thousand Day Radar, yeah. we'll be playing Talk is cheap. Where, where can I put my swan kind on it? <laughs> So now I'm going to go, that's great. Thank you so much for this. We're going to go, we're going to wrap this up with the rapid fire round. I'm going to ask five questions. So fast answers. Uh, number one, CEO who you admire. Many, but if I would have to choose one, I, I would still pick Elon Musk, but not, for his, not for his work on Twitter, oh. but, <laughs> but for his work. In, in like the real physical world? Oh. Yeah. Probably. Cars, solar, space, satellite communication, robots, and this Twitter thing. I, I mean, Number it puts two. stuff off that others deem unthinkable or impossible. Good. So. Number two, uh, favorite new AI tool? Uh, I have to go for Notion SO. And they just integrate tech that others ha have built, but they create a very cool product. If you don't know Notion, check it out. And the way they integrate in your notebook, productivity type of environment, AI, really smart. Oh, yeah. Stunning. I love it. Favorite movie about business? Favorite movie about business. <laughs> Last year. I, I stopped watching movies or, or regularly watching movies many years ago. I, I would just go for Wolf of Wall Street just because I haven't watched that many business movies. And it's fun, so why not? Maybe not the best answer possible. Uh, number four, what's your family situation? Uh, married, two kids, two and a half and 10 months. Nice. And uh, what should we read next? So if you haven't read it yet, read like the, the Taleb trilogy or at least the Black Swan and, and Anti-Fragile. And if you have read those, then go for Reinventing Organizations, which is also an awesome book. Yeah, I think that uh, I try and assign full by randomness to everyone where he started. Uh, I think that's his best written book. And uh, I think that also Talib needs an editor. And I think that after he dies, the person who edits him, because that's the only time you'll be able to edit him, will have a fantastic summary book. He's getting there, though. He's one of my yeah, favorite people. I would, on I, 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 I would beg to differ, but that's a discussion for the next time. I will leave some on the table. I hope we've uh, uh, explained things to everybody. But thank you so much, Thomas, for coming to us from Germany. Thank you for bringing Buessa Dortmund to the world in better new ways. Go big yellow black. And um, we look forward to our guidance that you will give us as we invent Swan Coin together. Thank you, thank you, and thank you more. Hey, looking forward to, to seeing this come to life. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, need any support, you know where to reach me. And thanks for having me to, to ramble, talk, discuss here. It was fun. Thanks very much, very much fun. Thanks again. So Sean, we are into an interstitial.